thank you for providing this opportunity to address this remarkably talented and knowledgeable group. Uh, I'm going to change. I'm going to change gears a little bit and speak really in ter from a macro perspective, uh, really from the perspective of a country as a whole, and obviously a country is, a, is, is made up, its performance uh, depends on, on some of the more micro issues that we've been just discussing, but I think it's worthwhile to, uh, to, add, to, that, uh, to add to that commentary a view from the top, as it were. Uh, what the Council of Canadian Academies does is uh, act as a secretariat, essentially, to support expert panels to study issues uh, that have policy significance and usually have a scientific really underpinning nice to them. Uh, we were asked by the Government of Canada to put a panel together to look at business innovation in the country. Uh, there was a strong suspicion that it wasn't up to uh, global standards or to what policymakers thought it ought to be, and we certainly confirmed that, but the point of the study was to look deeper into the reasons why. Uh, we, uh, we were interested in diagnosis, not policy at, that, at, at this stage, but clearly there are policy implications that come from what we, uh, what we found. Uh, a very long-term perspective, I think, is important. Over decades, and even we have a few charts in the report that go back into the, into the 19th century. Uh, perhaps the most important thing is that we regarded innovation uh, as an economic process and not primarily as a science and technology activity. So that really veers off a little bit from the discussion that we've been having uh, around, around the centers where innovation is really uh, being stimulated by academic science and uh, and the leading edge of technology. Innovation, of course, is a much, much broader concept than that and frequently involves business models and uh, process re-engineering within businesses and what have you. Uh, and, uh, of course, that, that view of, of innovation as an economic process uh, really sharpens the focus on the linkage between innovation and productivity, and that was particularly where the focus was. So innovation we thought of as simply newer, better ways of doing valued things, and uh, that means that innovation can be as, as uh, uh, perhaps as trivial in some sense as the hula hoop or as profound as the microchip and everything in between. Well, the starting point of the, of the investigation was the difference in productivity growth between the U.S. and Canada over a long period of time. And there isn't that much difference if you look over 45 years or so, but in the last 20 years, uh, Canadian productivity had been falling further and further behind the U.S. And the question then was, well, what are the underlying causes? And in standard, what are called growth accounting exercises, statistical exercises that try to get underneath the top line productivity numbers, uh, one analyzes first the capital intensity, uh, and in that case, Canada's capital intensity, in fact, had been increasing more rapidly than the U.S. over that whole period. And also, there's a workforce quality measure that uh, can be statistically analyzed relating to average levels of education in the population, uh, length of work experience, etc. And by that measure, too, Canada had improved more rapidly than the U.S. on average over that 45-year period. Therefore, what was the difference? Well, the difference is, the, is in the residual, something that economists call multi-factor multi productivity, which, if you look at it over a sufficient period of time, the panel decided is probably the best omnibus measure of innovation understood very broadly in the economy. So this far transcends uh, the, the lab and test tube type of innovation and includes really the intelligence with which capital and labor are combined in the economy. And just to give a couple of examples, I mean, when you double stack containers on a train with basically the same capital and the same train crew, you double the, you double the throughput of delivery, and all that extra output shows up as multi-factor productivity. Another example I like is when you put a, a drive through window in a fast food restaurant, you suddenly double or triple the capacity of your restaurant because you're using the seats in people's cars and you get a lot more output with very, very little input. Now, a more sophisticated 
uh, form of this uh, sort of multiplication of, of capital and talent would be the smartphone. And when people arrive at uh, a business, they have basically the whole uh, database of, of their company or what have you right at their fingertips. And it's an enormous productivity multiplier within the business sector. So that, and, and that extra productivity multiple that comes beyond capital and beyond simply the training of your labor force shows up as multi-factor productivity growth. And it's thousands of contributions to that, large and small, that really uh, drive productivity. So that raises a natural conundrum in those countries that still have productivity weaker than they think and not as innovative a business sector. Because if innovation is really so important for business, why has business strategy in Canada, and I think it applies in many other countries, been less committed to innovation than the pundits and the policymakers think it should be? Well, that's been a very big question in Canada and has been debated for many years. Uh, but we concluded, I think pretty definitively, that it's a consequence really of the history of the country. We had a tremendous comparative advantage uh, in terms of resources and an economic history that favored an upstream role essentially as an order taker in North American value chains. And uh, I'm reminded really of the comment about Nokia. Canada in some sense is a country version of Nokia. We were extremely good at producing things efficiently at low cost, but you know, you get a bill of goods from GM or whatever, and they say produce what you gave us last year, but 5% cheaper. So I can't say that there's no innovation involved in that, but it was very much an innovation from a bill of goods and not one that came or that depended on its stimulus from contact with end users, ultimate end users, in the marketplace. And I think that that's really where a lot of the, of the, uh, the stimulus for innovation at the corporate level ultimately occurs. But the point is that business strategy in Canada did adapt rationally and most importantly very profitably uh, to those circumstances. And business behavior, I can tell you, and this is another one of the most important lessons, will not change unless the circumstances change. I mean, this is adaptive behavior. Uh, individual businesses can fail and behave stupidly, but not a whole economy. Uh, now, I think the conditions, in fact, are changing dramatically in Canada, and we can talk about that later, but let me uh, turn to the next item. So what, we, what the panel then did was say, okay, uh, the, the, the usual analysis of innovation through research and development statistics and capital investment, human capital quality, that analysis really is a consequence. Those decisions are all inputs, as we know, and they're a consequence of a prior strategic decision by a business to adopt innovation as a major competitive strategy. So what the, what the panel looked at were a set of drivers of that decision. There are structural characteristics in an economy which are important. Uh, competitive intensity, I happen to believe, is of surpassing importance. The climate for new ventures, we've just been talking about that. Public policies play a role, clearly. And then there is this, uh, this final factor, business ambition, entrepreneurial drive, et cetera. And so in our report, we we analyzed each of these in the context of the Canadian economy to try and get a more granular understanding of uh, what was really motivating business. Now, I'm not going to go through that, obviously. There's a 250-page report. I brought along a couple of little disks with, with it on it, but you could get it from the council website at scienceadvice.ca as a free download. Uh, so, uh, let me just give you a few thoughts on Canada's innovation policy, uh, that is the policy piece of that rather complicated diagram. Canada, in fact, has been a model pupil as far as the OECD uh, an analysis is concerned. We've done virtually everything that the OECD analysts have said one ought to do. To, it's more or less a Washington consensus uh, model of approach to innovation. Uh, business taxes have been high, but they're now really world competitive. Uh, we have a scientific research and experimental development tax credit that perhaps next to Spain's is the richest in the world, by far the largest program of government support for the R&D type of innovation. But this last bullet is important and may be relevant to Spain in view of the, the strong regional character of, uh, of this country. 
Uh, national strategy to focus on strengths and to back winners and things like that is inherently difficult in Canada because of this diverse and regionally oriented political economy which works against concerted action. So Canada's innovation policies then have relied very, very heavily on, on market forces. Perhaps the one area where the government attempted to, to, uh, to push hard and in a focused way is in respect of university research and development. And you can see there, in about 1966, there was an incredible push to upgrade the capacity of the university system through a number of programs in an attempt to some extent to, to, uh, to counteract a decline in business R&D after the tech boom collapsed. Well, the problem is that the heavy funding of university research has, has produced very little by way of commercialization, which is an enormous frustration in the country. And I think the reasons for that are, are fairly predictable, and this, this too is important if not obvious. If you look at the, at the, uh, the continuum, basically, of the research spectrum from the basic side to development and marketing and the other way, and you look at the degree of focus of the universities as institutions and commercial businesses, you see that it's more or less like that, that the commercial businesses are obviously focused at one end and the universities at the other. So there's an inherent hole in the middle of the innovation system, and I think that this is a, this is a generic issue. It, it's true in every country. So what, what you see everywhere is an attempt to build this blue bubble uh, that, that fills the hole through venture capital markets, incubators. Uh, we just got a nicer idea a moment ago. Uh, the public labs, tech transfer offices and universities, etc. But what, what is true in this diagram is that if you don't have a strong pull coming from the right-hand side, from the business side, you will largely be pushing on a string. That's been Canada's problem. And I think th there, there is a difficulty, a, star a, start, a starting friction problem basically in a country that does not already have a very strong innovative or innovation-oriented business sector and that is, how do, you, how do you really get the pull dynamic going so that you get a virtuous circle between the pull from uh, scientifically sophisticated businesses and the supply factors coming from the knowledge generating side? Well, we haven't solved that problem yet. So, just a final slide. Th this, is, this is usually what you see when you read an OECD report or you listen to a talk like this. At the end, they say, well, what, what should governments do? Well, the bottom line is governments, I don't think, can do a whole lot. Uh, the metaphor I use is that a government's role is to sort of wax the surfboard, but business really has to catch the wave. And to the extent that there is a role uh, encouraging investment in advanced machinery and equipment, and particularly ICTs now, competition and um, outward orientation are always crucial, and particularly try and get your your exporters downstream and value chains closer to end customers. Uh, new ventures, uh, always a problem, and we know that the valley of death at the early stage is really where that problem is most acute. And then finally, uh, this breakdown to some extent of the Washington consensus where people are realizing that there is a role for more sector-oriented strategies to try to catalyze areas of opportunity. But the bottom line is really you have to get business strategy more focused on innovation. So that's, uh, that's probably all I can say in, in these few minutes. And uh, in Peter, the course of the next couple of days, we can talk further. Thank you so much.